Grace and peace to each and every one of you. Welcome to worship here at Covenant Presbyterian Church in Madison, Wisconsin. Wherever you are, I'm glad you found your way to worship with us today. My name's Charlie and I'm one of the pastors here. Before we go any further, I wanna introduce you to two new members. Craig and Sherry Anderson joined the church over this past week by meeting with our session. They had been worshiping with us a little bit before COVID started and they've stayed with us over the video time of COVID. Sherry's been involved with some Bible studies and small groups and they decided it was time to join. Sherry's a retired nurse. Craig is a retired respiratory therapist and Craig is also a Navy veteran. They both love the water. They spend a lot of time there. They also love traveling. They love reading books. And from what they tell me, they love Covenant Presbyterian Church, and they're very excited to get involved here. They've got three daughters and three granddaughters. Welcome, Craig and Sherry. We're glad you're here with us. As we gather for worship today, we continue journeying through the season of Lent, this holy time when Christians follow Jesus in the way of sacrificial love, when Christians reflect on how the journey is going, where we might have gone astray, where we need to get back on track. We are reflecting on the 10 commandments during this season of Lent to help us get back on track with God, looking at those commandments as guideposts and guardrails for the life that God offers us in Jesus Christ. Right here in the sanctuary, we've got a visible reminder of the Ten Commandments with the latticework behind the cross reflecting the two tablets of the Ten Commandments. Some people believe that the first tablet had the four commandments, the first four commandments that reflect God's teachings about humanity and God, and the second tablet reflecting the six commandments uh, related to humanity dealing with humanity. Well, today we're into the second tablet, looking at relationships within the family. So as we worship today, I invite you to prayerfully be thinking about your loved ones, about your family, and about how we're called to love one another. We're also gathering today to have communion, to share the holy meal that Jesus shared with his disciples. If you don't already, I encourage you to get some bread and some grape juice or something close to bread and grape juice so that you can share in this meal, in this holy meal, uh, the spiritual presence of our risen Lord, the bread of life and the cup of salvation to give us strength for the journey and a reminder of God's grace and God's love. So it's time for us to worship. It's time to sing. It's time to pray. It's time to listen. It's time to be fed. It's time to learn and grow as God's people. Let us worship God together.
us pray. Holy and gracious God, you came among us declaring good news to the poor and release to the captive. But we have not obeyed you. We have not followed this good news. We have not proclaimed it loudly. Instead, we have let ourselves be complicit in systems of impoverishing others and oppressing others. We ask your forgiveness in this complicity that we may be guided away and led in paths of repentance. You give your law not as an obligation for us, but as an opportunity for us to pursue righteousness. And so we pursue this righteousness knowing that you put a spirit of repentance and contrition in us. Help us to turn away from those evils that we have done for the ways in which we have abused your image and our siblings and our neighbors and our loved ones and your beloved children. You show us the path of righteousness, yet we turn away. Guide us to return back in that path. Amen. Now, as God's people, we are forgiven, forgiven by the grace and love and mercy of the great God who made us, who loves us, who redeems us, and who sustains us. And so we remember that God loves us and that God gives us strength to fight temptation and guides us in the new life. Let us recommit ourselves to living according to God's will. We will have no other gods before God. We will not worship idols or any false god. We shall keep God's name holy. We shall honor the Sabbath as a day of holy rest. We shall honor our fathers and our mothers. We shall not kill. We shall not commit adultery. We shall not steal. We shall not bear false witness against our neighbors. We shall not covet our neighbor's things. And we remember the teachings of Jesus. We will love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind. And we will love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. Part of the love that we share for each other is sharing peace with each other. Friends, may the peace of Christ be with you. I invite you now to share a sign of God's peace with your neighbor, whoever they may be, wherever they may be. May the peace of Christ be with each and every one of you today and always. Amen. Hi everybody, today I'm going to show you some things that could happen to pretty much anybody. I'm also going to show you a couple of ways that I act or react. And your job is to figure out which things I do that show love. Are you ready? Imagine that I'm really excited to go outside and play, but the person I'm going with still has to tie their shoes. I could Why do you have to be so slow? You're like the slowest person tying your shoes in the world. Or I could. So what do you want to do first when we go outside? Which way of acting showed love? You're right. Being patient is loving. Now imagine that I'm watching TV, my most favorite show in the whole wide world, and someone comes home from the grocery store. I could. Hey, oh, oh, let me help you with that. Or I could. (laughs) Hey. (laughs) Which way of acting was I showing love? You got it. Being kind is loving. Love is a lot of good things. In the Bible, there's a whole list of all the good things that love is, such as love is patient, love is kind, And basically, if you mess up, love doesn't mind. I bet it was really easy when you were watching me earlier in this video to tell which things I did that showed love. But how are you at telling if you show love when you're acting day to day? It's funny, but sometimes the people that we love the most are the ones that we get the most grumpy with, or we can sometimes be the most mean to. God's love is perfect. God loves us. God loves you always and forever. And God wants us to share that love with others. But as I said, sometimes it's hard. So we can pray, ask God for help, so that we can have more patience and be more kind, especially with the people that we say we love. 
Today, and really every day, I want you to pay attention and find out, are you doing things that show love? Imagine someone was watching a video of you, like you were watching me earlier. If they saw you doing things, would they say that you're showing love? And most importantly, would the person that you love, would they feel your love? Let's spread love. Let's spread God's love. And now let's say a prayer. Dear God, thank you for loving us in a way that's patient and kind, always and no matter what. Help us to share that kind of love with others. And now we pray as your son Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The quality of your life ultimately depends on the quality of your relationships. This is Relationship Advice, Family Counsel from Esther Perel, one of the best known living psychotherapists and relationship analysts in the world. Her most recent book called The State of Affairs details her understanding of family, partnership, love, lust, and loss. After over 30 years of private practice, counseling, and research on the topic of romantic relationships. Her 2015 TED Talk on infidelity in particular has over 16 million views. Perel has a private practice in New York City and is a daughter of Holocaust survivors. Her interest in relationships and families spans cultures, time frames, traumas, to bring her readers and her clients into more insight on who we are and why we do what we do. That is the big question for us this Lenten season as well. How then shall we live? Each week we're examining the Ten Commandments from the book of Exodus in order to remember that God asks us things. Today we look at two commandments that God asks of us. Number five and number seven, honor your father and your mother and do not commit adultery. And while they seem to be commanding two very different things, the two commandments actually do coincide. These two commandments are about relationships. They're about family. They're about the people we love the most, our partners, our parents, the ones we build lives with. So this morning we're looking at how we might live with these commandments in mind. But I think it's first worth exploring a little bit that these commandments were written in a very different context for a very different group of people. Perel, the relationship expert, explains this in the beginning of her latest book. She explains that for thousands of years, marriage and family were primarily modes of economic security and social safety. Relationships between spouses were, for, were not always for the sake of mutuality or care. Sometimes these relationships were forged for the sake of cultural norms, security, offspring. And relationships between parent and child were based on genealogical lines and survival first and foremost. Perel explains then that conflicts between parent and child or breaches of trust in marriage commitments were primarily threats to that social and economic security. Honor your parents and do not commit adultery meant slightly different things for the structures these commandments were speaking to. Now, in modern American culture, for example, we find ourselves in a completely different cultural context in which the predominant norms of partnership and family are that of love. We build partnerships, 
we get married, we have children, we navigate the complexities of all sorts of relationships, but not for the sake of survival, but for belonging, connection, joy, love, having a partner or children, not because you need them, but because you want them or you don't. But what is threatened when there are breaches in the relationships that we build that mean the most to us are not just economic security, though sometimes of course that's true, but emotional security, how we understand ourselves. Perel explains how this pertains to partnerships. She writes, quote, We have higher expectations of relationships than ever before. We want everything that we expected in traditional marriage in terms of companionship and economic support, family life and social status. And then we also want what a romantic marriage brings us, which is a sense of belonging and connection, intimacy, a best friend, a trusted confidant, a soulmate, end quote. And this understanding of what we are imagining in partnerships, we might extend this to relationships with family, parents, children, that we want and hope for both attachment and independence, belonging and freedom, security and self-reliance. We want to let our kids fly the nest, but be able to reel them back in at any moment. We will respect our parents, but we want to receive the same respect, recognition, and understanding in return. In our partnerships and in our families, we try for it all. We hope for it all. And so while our contexts and our norms and our opportunities to build family structures are quite different than our historic predecessors. There's definitely something still at stake in how we conduct ourselves in those relationships. And spanning thousands of years of cultural norms and change and choices, most of us, maybe all of us, generally agree on these same commandments even hope and expect these commandments, that children and parents would have good and loving, respectful relationships, that partners and spouses would honor and respect the agreements and promises they make to one another in that partnership and marriage. But it turns out it's not so easy as it appears. It turns out that these deeply meaningful, important, formative relationships between parent and child or between partners or spouses, it turns out that those relationships are also the ones where we find ourselves the most deeply hurt. Or we find ourselves inflicting the most hurt on the people we love the most. I have certainly been on the many sides of this kind of hurt. I've been hurt by the people who are closest to me. I've certainly inflicted forms of hurt, disregard, criticism, and betrayal on the people I love the most. And I am certainly not alone. For agreeing to them, we are generally quite bad at keeping these commandments. And I'm not just talking about infidelity or big breaches of trust or respect. So if you read Esther Perel's book, you'll learn that this is also the case, that we're quite bad at keeping those promises as well. But I'm talking about the general promises we make to one another as partners, as families. There's a lot at stake in these relationships. They're often the relationships in which we are the most vulnerable. And so when there is a hurt, it runs deep. Sometimes that hurt runs so deep that it feels irrecoverable. The commandments on family remind us how deeply important these relationships are. That to follow God and stand in right relationship to God means standing also in right relationship to each other, to the people who are closest to us. Quaker and social justice writers coined this language of right relationship. It's a way of thinking about and even visualizing and embodying 
how you stand in relationship to your family, to God, to others, to the earth, to your partners, to the ones who matter most. And it's not just in theory, but it's in practice. Right relationship means standing with acknowledgement, regard, respect, and awareness to, to another. Not against or enmeshed or back to back, but face to face. Sometimes standing in right relationship means doing so at a distance. Of course it does. There are harms and hurts that are irrecoverable close up. And that is true in partnerships just as much as it is true in families. Sometimes it takes a lifetime before we are ready to be proximate to the people who have hurt us. Sometimes being in right relationship means being held accountable for those hurts. Right relationship is not always comfortable. And these commandments are not always comfortable, even if they might feel familiar. Because we, while we are generally all in agreement that honoring your parents, honoring the promises of your partnership or your marriage are good things, good advice, good reminders, these commandments are also a reminder of how vulnerable we are in these relationships. That the people we love the most can deeply hurt us. That the people we hold so close, we can do such harm. How then shall we live? If Esther Perel's TED Talk on infidelity has 16 million views, it's because there are so many people hoping for, yearning for some kind of clarity on how to be in partnership, how to build a relationship or a family, how to understand oneself in right relationship to another, even when and especially when we're not getting it quite right. And we imagine that we know what this looks like. We imagine what right relationship, what love might look like, and we can draw on the wisdom that we have to do so. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not ex insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. This is 1 Corinthians 13, and we read this scripture at weddings. It might also have 16 million hits at this point. But we read this beautiful passage on special days and in the presence of families, loved ones, all those relationships we've built or rebuilt or are just beginning. But this wisdom offers us so much more than we give it credit for. What does it look like to live in right relationship, to follow these two commandments, not just on the most joyful days and not just after something's already gone terribly wrong, but all the rest? Be patient. Be kind. Don't be envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Don't insist on your own way. Don't be irritable or resentful. Don't rejoice in wrongdoing. Rejoice in the truth. The truth is, we're not so skilled at living in right relationship, at least not all the time. The good news is that these commandments give us insight on how to not just live and follow them sort of in theory, but in the actual relationships that matter the most to us. With love, with awareness, not against or enmeshed or back to back, but face to face. Because it turns out in our work to stand in right relationship to those who are most important to us, we also get to stand in right relationship to God. May it be so. Amen. We come now to a time of offering. 
a time when we think of the ways in which we can give of ourselves to serve our neighbors. You can see on the wall behind me all these pictures. These are things that we do as a church, as a body, as a community to offer of ourselves for our neighbors, from supporting our international mission co-workers to supporting the Boys and Girls Club through Presbyterians or even through Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, which is how our denomination supports and responds to disasters, both man-made and natural. These are just a small sampling of the ways in which we serve our neighbors, in which we offer of ourselves to give back from the gifts we've been given. And so now as we take our offering, I encourage you to think of the ways in which you give of yourself, the ways in which you sacrifice of yourself to make the world a better place, to serve God's people, and to show God's love to all of our siblings, all of God's children. Let us now take our offering. As we gather around the communion table, we share our joys and concerns within the church family. We have a white rose in the chancel area this morning. That is to give thanks to God for the life of covenant member Karen Raggetts, who died just over a week ago. And we also are praying this week for covenant member Colleen Gullickson, who's recuperating after a fall and for Anne Perry, Covenant member Anne Perry and her parents as her parents are navigating some health challenges. We also wanna keep praying for one another in this very challenging time. I've had conversations with families this week who are struggling with all sorts of issues as this COVID era continues. So we need to keep taking care of ourselves. We need to keep doing the best we can to be patient and kind and loving with one another and helping one another out and when we need help to have the courage to ask for it. So I'm glad you're here at the table 
at the table to share this meal that Jesus came to offer us, in part to remind us that we are never alone, to help us remember that God's spirit is always with us, giving us strength for our daily living. Friends, we're all invited to the feast. Let us pray. Loving God, thank you for the gift of creation. You made us from the dust of the earth. You breathe into us the breath of life and you set us in the world to love and to serve you and to live with purpose. When we rejected your love and ignored your wisdom, you did not reject us. You continued to love us and called us to turn again and again to you in obedience and in love. So we praise you and thank you. Out of your great love for the world, O oh God, you sent Jesus among us to set us free from sin and evil. He lived as one of us, sharing our joys and sorrows. Through his life, death, and resurrection, he releases us from the bondage to sin and frees us from the dominion of death. Remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, O oh God, we take this bread and this cup from the gifts that you have given us and we celebrate with joy the redemption that has been won for us in Jesus Christ. Accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving as a living and holy offering of ourselves that our lives may proclaim the new life that you offer the world in Jesus Christ. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these, your gifts, that the bread we break and the cup we bless would be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. Unite us with the living Christ and with all who are baptized in his name so we might share ministry in one time and one place and send us into the world to be your people. Hear these prayers, O God. Amen. And so we gather at the table, friends, and we remember how Jesus was with his disciples and he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it, giving it to them, saying, take and eat all of you. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after they had eaten, Jesus took the cup and he poured it out before them saying, this is the cup of the new covenant. This is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. The bread of life and the cup of salvation. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, thank you for feeding us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation. Thank you for the love you show the world in Jesus Christ. Help us to listen to his teachings. Help us to understand your law through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Help us to follow him. Help us to have the courage to recognize where we might have gotten off track and where we need to get back on track. Help us to encourage one another on the journey. We pray for the world around us, for family and for friends, for world leaders, for people who are suffering. We pray for your church. We pray for Covenant Church. Help us this very day, O oh God, to live in your love and to share that love with everyone we meet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
this day and this week. May this be a reminder to you to strive to live in right relationships, not just in theory, but in practice. And starting with the people we love the most, the people who are closest to us. And as you do so, may God bless you and keep you. May God be kind and gracious to you. May God look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.